professional development. I would say just topical issues that are going across the board as it relates to finance and risk in the market. And really delighted to welcome Yuri Dabrowski, who is the Chief Risk Officer of Lazard uh, Limited here, and really to talk through lessons learned. I know that the Wall Street Journal had a whole uh, story of on it this morning, uh, Financial Times yesterday uh, with Archegos, Credit Suisse, uh, Green Sill, all that good stuff. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn this over to uh, to Cliff and Yuri, uh, but welcome everyone. And again, thank you, Chris, for the introduction. Well, thanks, Rob, again, and, and again, to your team for your partnership and support over the years for all of our risk programs. So really deeply appreciate that. And yes, we are we are here today to, to discuss how Credit Suisse came to lose 5.5 billion, I believe it is, from transactions that had with Archegos a hedge fund that was placing bets in several stocks without actually buying the stocks outright. So we want to dissect that a little bit. Uh, at one point, just to give you a little bit of context for our Q&A today, uh, Credit Suisse had amassed uh, somewhere about 20 billion uh, in exposure to Archegos, but the hedge fund had actually only posted, I believe, 200 million in collateral. Uh, ultimately, uh, the hedge fund was unable to meet a margin call from several other banks. Credit Suisse was late in addressing the building up of this risk. And in the aftermath, Credit Suisse's, you know, there was some collateral damage, as you might expect. The head of the investment bank and the chief risk officer were removed. And the board actually commissioned a comprehensive post-mortem on the causes of this risk debacle. Uh, so to help us untangle <coughs> some of the complexity of the transactions and strategies uh, affecting Archegos and Credit Suisse, we've invited Yuri Dabrowski. Uh, as Rob said, he's the managing director and CRO at Lazard Limited. He's also the head of uh, global risk management at Lazard Asset Management. So Larry, you're wearing a, a lot of hats these days, busy guy. Uh, he joined Lazard back in 2005, has more than 25 years of banking and risk management experience, working at several large companies, including Credit Suisse First Boston. So we're lucky to have someone with deep knowledge of, to provide color commentary on this issue. So Yuri, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go right straight to the, to the first question here and say as a backdrop to this discussion, could you take uh, a few moments and describe to our audience a little bit about uh, more about Archegos and what their strategy uh, was that led to the risk event for Credit Suisse and some others actually. Sure. Good morning to everyone and thank you for inviting me. I hope it's going to be a fruitful discussion and we all learn something from it. Um, so Archegos was actually a family office, so there used to be a hedge fund uh, managing money for others, but after the SEC settlement, uh, I believe in 2012, they basically went to manage money only for the founder of the, so Archegos was just a money management arm for the family office of Bill Kwan. Uh, and the strategy was fairly simple, basically buying significant stake in companies, i.e. that means buying equity and uh, uh, taking a positive view on the direction of the stocks. However, instead of uh, using funded instruments, i.e. paying cash for equity instruments, which have zero leverage, right? The leverage is only sort of embedded through the balance sheet. They were using total return swaps. And maybe I'll just mention what sort of that means. Total return swaps have been around for more than 25 years. So the first time where I spent significant amount of time analyzing the total return swap was 1997. So I'm dating myself just a bit when I was at Deutsche Bank, but we, when we traded with one of the still largest um, hedge funds in the world, they were large then, they were you know, still large now, but th this instrument has been around for a long time. Um, in general, derivatives are contingent asset liability, right? So in one day they could be positive mark to market, another day they could be negative. That's the reason for contingency, but they're also, Linear or nonlinear, right? Delta one or non-delta one. Linear means swaps, i.e. Uh, there is no um, curvature in, in the mark to market of the, of the, of the, of the value of the, of the derivatives, like in options. Uh, so, so they're fairly simple, right? Total return swaps are just literally a directional view on the stock. And in, in the case of Archegos, they wanted to basically get the economic benefit of the stock price rising without paying $100 for $100 worth of exposure. And what they were paying basically is the initial margin. 
Clift, I think you mentioned that um, they had 200 million in exposure, sorry, in, in initial margin with 20 billion in exposure. That means about 10% initial margin. On average, I'd say the industry probably charges 10 to 15%. So it's not unheard of, but basically by design, the minute you enter into a transaction, you're looking at six to 10 times leverage to begin with. So you put 200 million and you're controlling 10 times more. Actually, in this case, 100. So I'm actually surprised. 20 billion and 200 sounds small, but 20 billion, I would expect 2 billion in margin. So that's, that's a little small, but typically it's, it's 10 to 15%. So let, me, let me kind of follow up on that. So, so Archegos didn't actually take these long positions in Viacom and Discovery and Baidu and some of these other companies. They that's actually right. were, were not buying the stock. It was, it was actually the, 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 the brokers that were doing that on their behalf, right? It was the, it was the Credit Suisses that were actually purchasing those assets as a reference asset underlying that total return swap, right? Yeah, so, so I think it's important to, uh, to mention that these are over-the-counter products and they are bilateral agreements. So these are not products that cleared anywhere or known to anyone. And I think one of the beefs with maybe regulators is how come we don't know the total exposure swaps or total return swaps. They might, you know, post 2008, you have a clear uh, product, let's say for credit road indices, for example, or for certain interest rate swaps, or for certain FX forwards. But total return swaps are not cleared, so they are literally an agreement between Archegos and Credit Suisse, Archegos and Nomura, Archegos and Golden. So what is very important is to understand the legalities of the agreement you have. So you know, what I was thinking about sort of issues in risk management in general, and in this case, I guess, Credit Suisse, a lot of times risk management is dealt, uh, you know, dealing with post factum, right? Something was done, trade was done, now manage the risk. Well, maybe I should have been managing the risk before the trade was done. So the first thing to start with, and this is what I personally did going back in the 90s, start with the term sheet. What am I agreeing to? Term sheet is still not a, formal legal document, but this is the proposal from the broker to the client, i.e. Archegos. And the term sheet is typically a couple of pages and it tells you, are you gonna get paid? What are the maturities, underlying uh, variables? So in this case, it was basically a swap that said, I have a maturity, uh, let's say five years, and uh, I have a finance. So the swap works a, a certain way. Um, you, the client, receive appreciation, you go along, right? I pay you appreciation in the stock, and for that, you pay me a financing rate. And the financing rate is typically attached to LIBOR, at some point it will be something else, but LIBOR plus some spread. However, and this is an important point, if the price of the underlying asset, i.e. stock, goes down, that means you're in negative mark-to-market, -market, you meaning Archegos, and this is where contingent liability comes into play. You're not just getting an asset if it depreciates, you actually might owe somebody some money if that goes below the strike, the agreed level at the beginning. And, and this is what happened to them. So uh, basically all of the securities that were underlying these total return swaps uh, dropped in price and it became a huge contingent, i.e. a huge liability for Archegos to pay. Now what happens is, um, and it, the setup worked even, even before the crisis, uh, an agreement between a broker and a hedge fund, or in this case, family office typically has daily margin. So yes, you put in post initial margin, you also have either resets on the swaps, which could be monthly, semi-annually, quarterly, to bring the market to market to zero, or you actually post margin daily. So there is a variation margin, i.e. somebody needs to be calculating things on a daily basis saying, you owe me this, I owe you that. And uh, barring minimum transfer, transfer thresholds, uh, you basically um, pay up or, or, or receive the money. In this case, Archegos could not make the margin call. Credits was called, Goldman called, others uh, called, and it looks like either they refused to make a margin call but all of that agreement is coming from what's called an ISDA and a credit support annex. 
all these terms. So basically, if you're, if you're a risk manager, if you're a good risk manager, I think you should be a part-time lawyer because you should know how to read these legal documents because at the end of the day, it's the economics that is translated into legal language. And can you walk us through a little bit about the, 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 my understanding is that Credit Suisse, we're going to get into this a little bit, but before I ask you this next question, I just want to say for those that are uh, listening in that uh, you can always uh, in the chat, if you'd like, when we get toward the end, we're going to take questions from the audience, if you will. Uh, so you can either raise your hand at the end uh, or have those questions in the chat ready for me to uh, ask to Yuri. Uh, but just to kind of tag on to that, uh, my understanding uh, from some of the uh, media that's been you know, writing on this subject that uh, uh, that they did not have a dynamic margining system in place, Credit Suisse that is, and that that might have led to some of the issues in their inability to get on top of this sooner rather than later. Do you uh, have any thoughts about that as to? Sure. Um, I'm, I'd, I'd be surprised if they didn't have it. I, I was there. Uh, Systems uh, at Credit Suisse, again, I was there 2004, 2005, not necessarily covering prime brokerage, but aware of what was going on. And this is a very simple product, literally getting a price of something that trades on the exchange, translating into a, a difference between that price and the struck price at the beginning of the swap minus the financing rate. It's, a, it's, it's arithmetic of a third grade. So not having that, I think it's a surprise if, if that actually happened. I think what probably didn't exist is either uh, a focused team that was taking that information. At the end of the day, systems, one models, they're only good if they give you an actionable insight. If you cannot act on it because either you don't have the right people to, to watch over that, or you haven't, you sort of missed your uh, the frequency of the margin calls. I don't know. It, uh, to me, it was more of an operational um, issue than not having systems. Uh, and maybe somebody just fell asleep at, at the wheel because as we know, Goldman and Deutsche were, and Morgan Stanley were, well, Morgan Stanley actually took ahead of it, but we're able to step out. And there is another um, point that I think is important and it's not specifically to total term swaps, but to be um, a part of ISDA and, and CSA, what is my grace period? If I make a margin call, I, the broker, broker is typically the calculation agent. So Credit Suisse is making a margin call to Archegos and they say, I cannot make it. During my time sitting on derivatives, which is slightly dated, but uh, I was heavily involved in this. During my time in uh, Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank, you have 48 hours. If you don't meet that margin call within 48 hours, I'm basically taking over your positions. I have perfected interest after that legal term, and I can just sell. I think now that 48 hours probably even shorter than before. I think in some cases it's 24 hours. So somebody needs to be watching this. I just feel that either they missed the window or they weren't watching also the market, right? The market is tanking. And uh, yeah. so I think that's more in that direction. I, I, I tend to agree with you. I, from what I've uh, read so far, it's, it appears that, um, you know, that, that they may not have been monitoring this as closely as they should, in part. I think there are a number of things that are going to come out of this we're going to find out more about. But one of those, recently, they actually hired somebody over there to actually do more of that sort of classic counterparty risk management. Um, and I'm, that kind of astounded me because that seems like, you know, risk management 101, that you would have that sort of, that monitoring, that basic blocking and tackling in place, wouldn't you? Well, <laughs> so uh, if you look at my bio, I was part of that team at Deutsche Bank from end of 1996 until 03, finishing as a deputy global head. So um, this concept of counterparty management or exposure management, as we used to call it, existed for many years. Credit Suisse did have, as I said, I have the benefit of being there 15 plus years ago. They did have uh, exposure management, but the dis difference was actionable. It's, it's actions that you, uh, that you uh, sort of uh, do that they'll perform based on the information you have. Credit Suisse had a 
bunch of mathematicians, so not a bunch, but a few, writing models, writing papers. What do I do with that information? If it goes nowhere, this is not applied math at the University of Maryland or any other university, right? You have to act on it. You have to do something with this information. Therefore, um, I think it's, it's a structural issue. What are people empower, empowered to do? What is the, your delegation authority? Risk managers need to take that input from either a model or a napkin. It doesn't really matter. And they need to make a decision. Do I sit in this position? Do I double up? Or do I, quote unquote, blow it, blow it out of the water? But I think it's more of a setup than anything. Uh, and then, and again, you, you kind of alluded to this too. So in, in, in measuring the company's market risk exposure in this case to, to this particular uh, set of transactions, I mean, they, they probably had some, I would expect they would have had, you know, their VAR models in place for this with VAR limits uh, imposed and the like. And uh, maybe if you wouldn't mind, I don't know how, how many people in the audience are kind of really familiar with that, but maybe just kind of a real quick uh, description of what those VAR models are trying to do and, and what the purpose of those limits are really trying to achieve for the for managing that risk exposure. So it, typically in, in the hedge fund space, so maybe I'll back up for a second on potential future exposure, but typically exposure management looks at what could happen uh, to my derivative book. And again, banks have huge derivative books, hundreds of thousands of positions, and they're complex. And what you're trying to do is forecast what could happen to the mark to market of each derivative individually, as well as a portfolio, including complex netting rules uh, out to potentially 30 years. So I can tell you during my days at Deutsche, we had 30 year projections with 55 time points. Uh, closer to today, these points are daily and weekly. Further out, they're years or you know, semi-annual quarters. Um, but the point is, I'm trying to forecast. And if I forecast an asset for broker, in this case, broker, right? I.e., if I'm forecasting that Credit Suisse could be in the money of a certain amount with certain confidence level, I need to figure out if I'm comfortable with it. So credit officers, typically at banks, would say, okay, Archegas, very good counterparty, how much money am I willing to lose to them if they were to default, right? This is senior unsecured. If I were giving them a loan, how much would I give it to them? And they should have a view. You put that aside and then you try to figure out again, what's the, my book and what's the forecasted value of my mark to market could be on one hand, purely mark to market. On the other hand, what if they don't post? If I, if, what if they don't post that margin? They don't post that margin, I have a grace period to wait and be friendly and nice while having an adverse market movement against me. So VAR model come in into play where I'm basically saying, I made the margin call, they're still whatever, they're, they're doing something, but they're not posting, market goes against me, what could it be? What's the adverse effect? So down your risk, at a certain confidence, I prefer 99. Uh, number of days could be argued. Some people use two, some people use five, we use 10, used to use 10. But basically is, because you, you get into legalities and I think that's what happened. Credit Suisse was trying to be nice. They were hoping to save the business. They were talking to other brokers. The ones who survived basically sold positions because their raw models plus the mark to market they already had on the positions, i.e. in the money positions, were above and beyond the limit they set as far as senior and secure risk is concerned. Yeah, I think I think that that's a key point here that uh, really kind of a lot of what we do in risk management, right, is, is tied to these highly analytical models and kind of getting closer to real time, if not real time, certainly on the on the market risk side with these bar models. But, you know, it's it, it, it's 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 interesting in the sense that um, Archegos, when when you kind of step back and you talk about the, or think about their strategy, um, and that they did not, they, their strategy was not to actually buy those stocks. And there, there, are, there are a number of kind of reasons for why they can do that, right? Because my understanding is that there, there are also, also these disclosure issues around um, Reg 13F, I believe it is, right? And around hedge fund reporting, particularly around these total return swaps don't have to be made. So, so do you think that 
uh, you know, reporting disclosures for hedge funds on, on total return swaps would be a, a good thing going forward as a way to kind of bring greater transparency into the market on these things? Or do you think it's still a good reason, you know, for hedge funds not to have to, to disclose those types of transactions? I'll probably agree with the former. If, if I'm a hedge fund who is levering, i.e. I'm borrowing, Explicit borrowing from a from a broker through a prime brokerage relationship, but then I use a funded instrument, i.e., I take cash and I pay for the stock. I have to report over ten percent, right? So basically, regulators and everybody else who needs to see can see my ownership. There's a bit of a lag, but you can see. If I'm literally doing the same thing economically, except instead of explicitly borrowing, I'm using total chunk swap to create that um, implicit leverage. I don't have to report. Why is it different? So I think I would prefer to force that disclosure so we can actually get on the level, play, level playing field because there was no really difference between the two strategies. Yeah, it, does, it does feel to me that that might be a uh, kind of a uh, next step, if you will, to you know dealing with these kinds of transactions in the future. I'm also, it's you know, back to the other point that you were talking about that uh, uh, Credit Suisse is maybe a little late, actually fairly late relative to like Goldman Sachs and maybe Morgan Stanley and possibly an, an, another at least institution that was working with Archegos at the time to get a, to get out from under it. And, and, I, and I wonder to what extent the, uh, the, the infrastructure, the risk infrastructure at those institutions were um, a little bit more nimble to be able to extricate those companies from the losses, right? Because at the end, I think there was something like 33 billion and, you know, uh, and, you know, in fire sale that they had to actually uh, get un, uh, out from under, right? All the, all the banks that were involved with that. And so it's kind of like a rush to the exits and uh, trying to unwind those positions is really tricky. And you need to be guided by your risk infrastructure to be able to help make those decisions quickly. So any, any thoughts about how, you know, you would, you would design the optimal system to kind of make sure you're in a good position to, to move quickly in those cases like this? Sure, I'll, I'll answer your question, but I actually don't think it's risk infrastructure. I think it's risk culture. I think risk it's culture. culture. Uh, I we want to get, we, I want to explore that some more because that's a, that's a big one for me. Okay. As I said, listen, this is it. I am very, if they didn't know um, the mark to market of their positions daily, they shouldn't be in the business of prime brokerage. This is too simple. And this is not a, this is level two product. And the only um, re real reason it's, it's level two, it's because it's simple model. I'm emphasizing the word simple model, mark to market with observable inputs. This is one of the simplest products to, to value. So I, not having this in 2021 is a huge surprise if that was the issue. I think the disconnect is who is making the decision on the information that you get out of that system. Either people are too junior, people don't know who to escalate to, or it was not sort of approved of, of, of bringing bad news. This was a very business friendly culture, which is great. I'm totally pro business. And I always say that risk management should not be a business prevention exercise. Right, we are not here to say no. What we're here to do is to say yes, but figure out what can blow us up. And that's the value of risk management. It's knowing the surprises and knowing what we don't know. Knowing that we don't know every, we don't know everything. So you need to always be sort of inquisitive and try to figure out. But if there is no actionable insight, if there is no venue to raise it to the CRO because he she only care about the P side of PML. That's dangerous. Uh, so as far as designing, I think it's simple. You know, number one, mark to market on a daily basis, right? Get it from various systems, preferably independent from front office, because front office can and should be able to, wrong word, but manipulate, but change their inputs if they feel that the market is, let's say, not reflecting their views. So if somebody says, I would like to change my credit spreads on my convertible bond valuation, it's okay for front office, so you can buy, let's say, uh, sell a security if you think it's undervalued, overvalued. That should not go into uh, official books 
because again, you're biased, you're not independent. It should be independent inputs with separately designed sort of uh, big picture systems. But then you need to calculate all the variation margins and initial margins, have collateral management on top of it, but also, and I think this is an important point, having a challenge process, right? So I always talk about, so you get the result. We, are, we as an asset manager, at least half of us are as an asset manager, um, uh, at the you know, benefit of, of a calculation agent, which is the broker, right? What if the broker can make a mistake? Intentional and intentional doesn't really matter. They can make a mistake. How do I know? Do we have the ability to challenge and question what I'm receiving as a margin call? Just because it's different from yesterday doesn't is not enough. You should have enough of an infrastructure on the on the buy side to actually um, you know to actually question what you're receiving. And that's a tall order. A lot of buy side managers are not capable of doing it for various reasons. The challenge process is extremely important, especially if you're gonna go into complex products. During my career, we had a, a dispute with one of the other large brokers uh, uh, to the tune of $80 million. This is a variation margin difference. You know, we get a call for $80 million and collateral management knew who to go to. They went to exposure management and they said, can you help us figure out if this is correct? And we came back so saying it's not, pushed back. And the trick was the other broker forgot to update their volatility surfaces for this option book. So knowing uh, sort of the detail, understanding what drives different things, including your PL, your VAR, is very important. But again, ability to escalate and raise it to senior people who can make decision, quick decisions on imperfect information is very important. On this, on this culture issue, and again, I cannot hear you well. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, this issue with with culture is a is is a significant one for a lot of different reasons, and I think there there is some work going on to try and understand why the board wasn't made aware of some of this as well, and how does that sort of like get pushed down? But I understand that there were a couple of key risk managers at Credit Suisse at one point that had actually voiced concerns over their risk-taking posture at its prime brokerage arm. So there is something to that. Uh, one of them actually left the company from what I, what I understand. They're, the other died in a tragic ski accident from uh, another thing. And then uh, that just left a huge gap in the organization with apparently to your point, some junior people actually left in place to manage the risk. So I guess it, just kind of a variation of that this is why key person dependencies can be such a, a big deal at some of these institutions and why it's important to, you know, do a lot of succession planning and have people sort of groomed to step in at the right time, right? I mean, that this seemed like this could have been a critical issue for them as well. Um, I think there the were a number of issues. One, if they felt that um, prime brokerage was an important business, and in this case, this is not prime brokerage, this is synthetic prime brokerage. Right? It's, it's, it's actually a swaps business. Um, one, you have to have the right infrastructure. You have to have the right people. But again, I would never blame junior people. I would blame senior people. If they have not created the environment for junior people to succeed, it is only their fault. Yeah. Junior people cannot, you know, they, they, they need the environment to succeed so both junior and senior people look good, right? Otherwise, it's, so I would never blame junior personnel. They either didn't have the tools, the infrastructure, or the, the again, the appropriate culture to, um, to enforce things and to make decisions on things. Um, you know, I think, again, I've, I've been around long enough. I felt that um, risk management, at least at the time when I was there, Credit Suisse was very much of a reporting, uh, uh, fancy reporting, sophisticated reporting, but reporting setup. Uh, and a lot of decision making was still left to front office. And in reality, I think real risk management is front office function. We're just independent. We're different. We have similar skills, but we look at the other side of the distribution more often. But at the end of the day, it's a partnership. And you know, I can tell you. I can go head to head with any trader or any portfolio manager. 
not because I think I'm smart, because, but I, I understand products and I understand their angle. I try to understand that. And I want to convince them that what I'm seeing makes sense. I could be wrong. I, they could disagree with me, but as long as we create that dialogue, I had instances during my time, happened to be at Credit Suisse, where I went to the desk and I said, you have to cut your positions. And in this case it was Mexican swaps. Not because I don't like it, but because I had a reason. And I voiced that reason. And the trader said, I agree, give me five days, huge PL, we can do it. Senior management of that desk agreed also. Unfortunately, risk management, senior risk management didn't agree because they felt I overstepped because I was too forceful. You cannot be too forceful. As long as you're respectful, as long as you voice your opinion and can back it up with something, they'll respect you even if they disagree. Yeah, I, I, they, they can at times. I, I, I unfortunately worked for a few companies that had terrible risk cultures, at least during my tenure. And uh, it kind of, you know, you could push all you want and business would just say, yeah, no. So I, I hear what you're saying. And I think that a lot of that terrible culture has been wrung out of the, the, the banking sector. I think there might be little vestiges of it here and there because we see these pockets of events that pop up every now and then, right? Uh, for different reasons. But I, you know, I, I, I echo your, your sentiment about, you know, you can't blame the, the junior people. I think because it's, this, it's, it's the organization, right? That has to set that up in a manner for everybody to succeed. And I think the fact that they, uh, took out the uh, the head of the investment bank and the, and the chief risk officer is a sign at least that they recognize that, you know, the, the buck stops here effectively for, for those senior folks. And that's, uh, you know, that's always the, that's always the, the thing at the end of the day, you've got to hold people accountable for that. But I think there are other, other aspects of this that go beyond just those individuals that we've been talking about that kind of led to this. It's a, it's a, it's a sequence of, of kind of unfortunate events, like many of these risk events are right. I mean, there, you can't kind of just like push on one thing and say, well, it's definitively this or this. It might be a whole host of things. And we've talked about them, right? We've talked about some of it could be tied up with, you know, their speed to being able to kind of understand, you know, what they were looking at at the time. Although I totally agree with you that a sophisticated institution like a Credit Suisse is doing these kinds of transactions should have been all over that. So I find that like yourself, hard to, hard to imagine that that could have even been part of this. Um, so so let, me, let me put it this way. Do you look at this as a, as a uh, and maybe it is a, there's a different view on this one too, is this uh, more a classic counterparty credit risk or is there, is this a, an operational risk event? I think it's both. I think, again, if, if you define uh, operational risk as, as a wrong setup <laughs> um, and, or ineffective setup, uh, to me, it's both. It's market risk, it's credit risk, it's exposure management, it's operational, it's all of the above. But again, it starts from the top and it starts with risk culture. If we, when we are planning, if I'm head of an investment bank and I'm planning to build this prime brokerage business, I need to, one, have the head of risk right next to me brainstorming. Because all these limits, you know, sometimes people put limits in place. And when I asked why is this limit? Why this number and not another number? And they said, well, because I don't have to set any regulatory capital uh, at that level. That's the wrong incentive, right? Tell me what you're trying to accomplish. And then let's figure out how much risk do you need to have to accomplish what you're looking to do, whether it's, uh, it's, it's on the buy side, you know, long only management or, or PL coming from the trading desk. It doesn't really matter, but you have to start at the very beginning together. And P and L are, P and L are as, as important, they're equally important, even though L, I think, gets you to on the front page of her Wall Street Journal and P doesn't. Right. And right. That's so, that reputation so, risk, right? Right. Right. Yeah. So, so I think I think it's all the above to, 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 to your question. Yeah, this is why it's 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 uh, you know, being a risk manager is tough. We got all those different points of triangulation. But can I just maybe one more point? And yeah. I don't mean to pick on the CRO of Credit Suisse, but I think, especially on the banking side, right? Products are not simple. They're not just loans, they get securitized. They're not just investment banking products, whether it's uh, cash only or derivatives. The hurdle to get in or the hurdle to be good at it is, is not low. 
right? You need to have certain uh, educational and hope background as well as experience to, to do well. You still could do maybe a job, but really to do it well and progress, I think you need to have certain criteria. And if the background doesn't fit, it doesn't mean you're not smart. You just, you might not fit the role of a, of a CRO, the role of a head of risk. I would argue that honestly, compliance and risk are also two different things, right? Uh, yeah. One typically is more of a legal regulatory side. The other side is, should be more prudential. What do we need to do to make sure that our business is thriving? We are doing the right things by our clients and everybody's pleased. And by the way, as a subset of that, I can make all the regulatory reporting needed. But, but just sort of picking people who are smart but to, from totally the different backgrounds and just putting them into roles, I think it's, it's the one thing to do. Yeah, it, it does remind me that you do have to have strong people that, that know these, these risks in place, but you also have to, you know, you just can't let that uh, be a, a crutch, if you will. You also have to be close, uh, closely aligned to, to what's going on in there. And I'd say that's the same thing for the board, right? So the board risk committee, in my mind, at least, that I know they've done a lot, of, done some work in this area, looking at, at folks that actually sit on a lot of these boards, and they just don't seem to have a lot of the background that's necessary to kind of ask the right questions, right? Uh, they may not be all that experienced. Maybe it's different from Lazar, but but at the same time, you know, folks that actually have that that ability just to ask about the, the total return swap type of question so that they can feel comfortable. Do we have, you know, we've got, we've got this much outstanding exposure to, to, to uh, Archegos. Does that feel right that we have that much concentration in this one counterparty? Those kinds of basic things seem to me to be like no brainers in, in some respects. I think not every board has a risk committee, but big banks do now after the crisis. But I agree with you, I think having the right people, but also, Again, it depends on what bubbles up to the board level, yeah. because you have this distinction between oversight and operational day-to-day. -day. And typically boards try to stay away from the operational day-to-day -day and uh, maybe that's the disconnect. I think you need to get enough granularity to the board to actually ask the right question. They might have the right people, but if they don't get enough information, However, again, if you have the right background and somebody says, give me a presentation on prime brokerage, and if you don't get any detail on type of products that we, let's say, finance, that's already a red flag. So yes, I think it starts with people at the top who need to ask the right questions so the right amount of information actually bubbles up to them. I'm monitoring the chat, and this is, this is a lively chat room that we have here, so I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, start kind of weaving some of this in because uh, there's one in particular that just came in from from uh, from John that I want to kind of read to 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 folks John John Kronetsky. Um It said the board can only react to what is reported to them. I I agree with that, right? So there there is a two way street. The board the board needs to you know engage in effective or credible challenge to management on these issues, but at the same time. You know the risk. The risk folks have got to step up and provide the right reporting to them. So it's, it is that two-way street. That's a tough one sometimes, but um, right. Plus, the board can ask tough again, as you said, tough questions or make management's life slightly more difficult by asking the, uh, the tough questions. Therefore, forcing management to be either a bit more transparent or think through and improve. So, so in the, in the, before we kind of turn it over to some more of the questions that we have, we got a bunch of these to kind of ask uh, about. If you're sitting back and uh, kind of observing how this, this event unfolded for Credit Suisse, what would be, if you were to kind of like condense it down, what would be the lessons that you would take away for other risk managers that were having to manage this type of risk? Well, number one, make sure that you have all the information necessary to make decisions, easy decisions and tough decisions. So I, you need to have the right infrastructure to get all the metrics that you think are relevant. That's number one. Um, however, overload of data, you know, data is not information. So it has to be relevant. Then 
you need to have the right people in the room to actually understand uh, changes in patterns, understand um, what these metrics actually mean in the real world. Uh, and, and then you have to partner with, with the business, right? So if, I, if I'm watching Prime Brokerage, I would want to sit with head of Prime Brokerage probably weekly, if not more frequently, just to say, okay, are we seeing the same thing? Because again, both sides have vested interest. As you can see, both risk and head of investment bank lost their jobs because either they were not on the same page or both were on the wrong page. So uh, it's, 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 it's constant dialogue. It's, it's watching the right metrics, but again, having the right people make decisions on imperfect information. And I think what happened was probably Goldman and Deutsche and to a certain extent, Morgan Stanley did make decisions on information that either didn't have or took a chance on even the legal side because they jumped, right? They started selling very quickly. Either the agreements allowed for that grace period to be under 24 hours, maybe, I don't know. Or they just said, you know what, cash is king. Let me uh, take care of this and then I'll see you in court, maybe. So, so this is also, again, it's, it's, it's a gray area, but, but I think quick decision-making on information, either perfect or imperfect, is very important. Yeah, I, I, that's a good way to kind of. Sorry, sorry I can't hear you again. Oh, sorry, that's a good way of sizing that up, Yuri. Um, uh, Martha's got a question here, and I think this is a good follow up Hi, you know, to what we uh, were talking about a little earlier. So, why do you think the leverage was so outsized? Going back to your earlier point, Yuri, that it would be expected to be around 10%. Well, no, actually, it was probably, you know, uh, six to 10, right? I don't think banks will give, uh, I'm very surprised if the number is 1%. That, that's just, that goes back to sort of Lehman days where they had the 33 times leverage. Um, so I think it's, it's but even then it's, it's high. It was a highly concentrated portfolio that ended up with correlation of one. And again, it had a leverage of seven to 10 times. So I think the biggest question is, how do we, if I'm the regulator, how do we empower brokers to ask questions on the relationships away from their own bilateral? You know, because Credit Suisse didn't know that there was Goldman, then Morgan Stanley and Nomura and Deutsche Bank on top of it. They thought they were, maybe they were solo. So I think the, the, it's, the caveat here is how do we, enforce the industry to sort of share information. Again, it's, it's a tough one. Uh, so you have a bigger picture of that family office or hedge fund relationship. And maybe by disclosing, by the way, Cliff, so disclosing of their positions, because at the end of the day, they would have had to disclose then collective exposure to financing from Goldman and from Credit Suisse and from everybody else. Again, on the lag, but it would be that. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a, that 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 is an important point, right? If if Archegos is not having to disclose other, you know, TRS that they've got going on with with those companies, uh, it's a black hole for anybody else trying to figure out what exposure they really have uh, on their balance sheet. I, I'll go back to sort of the, the mortgage analogy of that is is kind of in the in the situation of first versus second liens, where folks are sitting on top, you know, they might have originated the first lien mortgage but don't know that uh, two weeks later they go down the road and take out a second link for you know, $100,000 with another institution. You just don't know what you're hanging out there with sometimes. Right. And I think that's systemic, right? Then you yeah, have, right? yeah, I agree with that. We, you know, so John, John uh, Kranetsky has another uh, point here or question, and it's an interesting one because it's kind of tied into the, to the whole COVID thing. So did the fact that, that we were in the middle of the COVID pandemic and many people were, remote, were working remotely contributed to the loss slash, slash size of the loss slash length of time it took before it was detected. Any thoughts about that? Maybe. I, I Maybe. think it depends on company setup. I can tell you that uh, the risk committee discussions we had uh, personally in March was, do we have enough VPNs for people to remote? Is this uh, somebody who actually enjoys markets? No. But this is what's important. So basically, as a risk team, as a risk committee, as senior management, 
you should be able to pivot to any topic relevant to the moment. And I wouldn't be, maybe, maybe Credit Suisse were just not ready to remote work or people, again, were not incentivized. If you don't have enough senior people, again, if you have a, uh, this type of um, event when you're in the office, you can just get everybody in the room, head of business, head of risk, and make some sort of a decision very quickly. Because everybody was remote, theoretically, uh, that could be um, a potential you know, uh, reason. But the, again, others didn't have that problem. So I think it's a combination of things. It's cultural as well as potentially COVID remote. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, here you had, to your point, I mean, a, a couple of these institutions at least were able to kind of unwind uh, much more quickly at uh, far less damage than uh, Credit Suisse. So there's something there that... Uh, that uh, but also the unwind is, so it's not just getting, it's actually getting the trading desk involved yeah. to make sure they can execute. So uh, somewhere uh, it broke down and I don't know if it's the decision to, uh, to understand you know, the exposure to, to the point we need to unwind to actually finding the trader who will do it. Here's, here's a question from Rose. He says, isn't, isn't, the, isn't the risk management supposed to sign on A the, the, to the counterparty exposure limit and B allowed structures and an underlying security. They usually see specific transactions on a post fact basis. Is my understanding correct? I think it depends on the setup. As I mentioned before, um, during my days at Deutsche, which I, um, yeah, I thought there were good days. Um, again, we're talking 96 to 95, 203. But we had exposure management and you're right. We looked, so there was a credit department that was signing off on effectively senior unsecured loans. And senior unsecured could mean a loan, or it could mean an exposure from a derivative. When it came to an exposure from complex derivatives, they would reach out to exposure management, i.e. my team, or I was part of that team, to say, what is the number, right? What do you think is the risk? And that number would depend on the type of a product, the type of the uh, agreement or term structure, sorry, term sheet or is the uh, agreement, as well as on, on whether it's margined or not, collateralized or not. And based on that, the exposure management would come back with the number and then credit would sign off or not sign off. You know, in certain cases, we basically, we had situations where I think I remember trade, trade was huge. And I think we said uh, the risk is, I don't know, half a billion dollars, the risk itself i.e. contingent asset that you could end up on your book could be worth 500 million in terms of mark to market. And if the counterparty were to default, you can do the math. Minus recovery rate, if you want to multiply, multiply by default probability, fine, you can do that. But the reality is it's a large number. What is your appetite? And the appetite was 400 million. What's the difference? Margin. So you, hedge fund, you, the family office, should give me the difference between the amount we think is the risk and the appetite you have for senior and secure. And that's sort of the, the additional. So uh, long-winded long answer to your question, yes, credit should be signing off on pre-trade, but I think it depends on the company. And again, yeah, it depends this is on what kind of, whether it's play vanilla or complex. I totally agree. I mean, one of the things that that, uh, that reminds me of too is that counterparty risk, particularly in as you you started us off today just saying look we're not we're, we don't have a clearinghouse or, or an exchange mechanism here underlying this this is flat out you know good old-fashioned counterparty risk 101 that that uh you've got to be very close to and uh and it does come back to having if you're gonna if, and compounded by also these kinds of these kinds of transactions in their own nature, right? So this isn't just for everybody. But Credit Suisse is a big bank, right? A very complicated institution that can do this, and so this is why there was such a big surprise, I think, that happened. I guess, but but I I, I kind of this is a long-winded way of saying I, I totally agree with with what you're saying there, and it, and that the emphasis on having those capabilities in place to surveil and conduct that kind of analysis in not maybe real time, but pretty close to it so that you can be more nimble and be able to get out from under this in the right time is, is paramount, so. I actually um, think it should be real time 
for sizable, for plain vanilla, if you're trading day in and day out in FX forwards, fine. I would say just get, get a, a good system and pre-clear or pre-approve certain things. If these are complex, couple of billion dollar positions, you need to have oversight before and after. And people who should be reading this before should, as I said, understand term sheets, ISDAs, and CSAs. So they actually understand the economic nature of the product you agree to. And unfortunately, I, I assume not every company that has that, even though, as yeah. I said, in certain cases, right. we did it. Yeah. You know, it, it, it reminds me that and I sometimes feel like I'm talking to them blue in the face on this one, which is, you know, the basic blocking and tackling of the components of risk management sometimes feel like they're so easy to, to accomplish and yet become so, for some reason, can be the, the Achilles heel at the end of the day for some of these things, right? You don't spend the system, right? You've heard of it before. People don't spend the, the, the amount of money they need to, to have the right systems in place. And I don't want to disparage my, my former employer too much, but Citigroup, right? Recently had had some stuff that was shown under them because they, you know, some of their, really their familiar risk management systems were a little deficient, a little creaky there. So um it happens to a lot of institutions and and yet i think that's that's a it's 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 not the most exciting part of risk management right but it's it's enormously important at the end of the day to have that have that in place i think now there is certain level maybe of complacency because the world of technology moved so fast so far it became all these risk systems and risk engines became commoditized and where before, you know, I or somebody on my team were forced to do it either in the spreadsheet or on a piece of paper or on the napkin, but somewhere sort of manually, you actually had better understanding of the product. Where here, okay, the system will spit it out. Are you questioning the model? Are you questioning the inputs? Garbage in, garbage out. Is this the right curve that is forecasting your, your potential exposure or your value at risk that you will compare against the limit credit just set? So, so I think there were a lot of variations to this, um, but uh, to be fair, all these banks, including Credit Suisse, were chasing this business, right? It's know your customer. They had to do the due diligence and everybody was willing to, uh, I guess, you know, close their eyes on certain things. Everybody wanted to more, more money, more business. It was probably self-funded prime brokerage, um, but this is the downside of it. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, I've got another question here that uh, could 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 uh, spark some discussion, but I'm gonna I'm gonna ask it to you anyway here, Gary, uh, based on your earlier comment at the top of the hour. Um, are total return swaps a type of what Warren Buffett referred to as a financial weapon of mass destruction? Are they good or are they evil? The answer is I don't think they're evil. I think Warren Buffett uh, quite often talks his own book, even though I tremendously respect the individual. Um, I don't think, you know, the fact that you don't understand a product doesn't mean it's evil, right? I think it's just, it's what you do with it. Uh, this is a fair, it, it is a simple product. You know, I would argue then CLOs, um, uh, weapons of mass destruction, right? They're more complex. This is actually a simple product where a napkin will help you with marking it to market. It's the process and the culture that is deficient to understand the complexity, the magnitude, and the downside. Again, equity markets are quite volatile. If you're giving leverage to single security, you could expect a significant drawdown against you or in your favor. Against you if it's market risk, in your favor if it's credit risk and somebody's defaulting on the other side. You need to think of both sides. People forget what's called wrong way exposure, right? Underappreciating the right. fact that if, if somebody owes you something, you might be standing in line at the bankruptcy court. If you owe them and you didn't default, you have to pay even if they defaulted. So, so I think, again, there is a, the devil is in the detail. I don't think any of these products are weapons of mass destruction, but I think regulators need to understand the systemic nature and force disclosure post factum and maybe even before, let's say, Credit Suisse and Archegos uh, create a relationship, they need to disclose to each other uh, more than I guess they did before. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think that's uh, for sure. I've, I've never subscribed to that either, that, that opinion that 
uh, derivatives are this, this terrible thing. Those of us that know that space pretty well would come to the conclusion that they uh, have in fact a, a very strong uh, role within uh, our community to effectively manage that risk if they're done in the right way. And that's, you know, that's a big yeah. And honestly, even credit derivatives, right? I, I think sure. buy side feels uh, the pressure that was put on them by uh, banks or brokers um, getting rid of a lot of single name swap desks. The liquidity is not the same and it creates other issues. You know, there are different ways of dealing with backlogs of derivatives or clearing of that, but, but it's not necessarily destructing and remo removing them from sort of a, a toolkit. Well, I'm mindful of the time, everybody's time and your time, Yuri. And I just want to, again, thank you so much you for, for coming on and so talking much. to us about a very complicated you, risk issue. And to the audience, again, many thanks for your attendance and uh, uh, hope you'll be attending more of our risk leadership webinar series in the future. And Rob, as always, uh, thanks again. So we'll leave it there for now and uh, look forward to seeing you all at some future events. Thank you, Cliff. And, and thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, thank you all. Thanks, everyone.